Hi again. All right, so today we're going to talk about international marketing. So we're not going to talk about the fundamentals of marketing. I assume you know all that, you know, market segments and uh, product promotion. What we will talk about is the specific challenges or unique challenges that you are likely to face when you decide to market your products internationally and what are the best practices for dealing with those challenges. Now, before we get into the, all the details, let's talk about things that will definitely create a problem. For example, when you go into a new market and you decide to sell your product in a different country, one of the challenges you will face is differences in languages. And so at the very, very least, you will have to translate your promotion materials, your advertisements or your uh, um, commercials that you use in uh, magazines or on TV. And sometimes language translation may not be so easy. Even British and English and American English are different. So here are, for example, a few phrases that would be understood in the UK, but would make no sense or make different sense in uh, the United States. So, for example, uh, when somebody says, how will I know when he's here? Well, he'll, when he comes, he'll knock you up, Mary. And so knock you up in the UK means he will knock on your door. Uh, what it means in the United States, you probably know. Same thing if you say, I live in a block of flats. In the UK, it would mean you live in an apartment building. And uh, in the United States, it doesn't mean much. The block has a different meaning there, and block of flats is just never used. So you have a little cartoon here where you see that the pirate is trying to use the old practices in a uh, cowboy prairie. So walking, making somebody walk a plank, and uh, clearly it works on the sea, but doesn't work uh, in the desert. Now, here are some famous marketing uh, bloopers. So things that didn't work out because of the language differences. And so let me give you some examples. Um, for example, when Electrolux, a Scandinavian uh, electronics manufacturer, uh, entered the United States, uh, must have been in the 80s or early 90s, they were using a slogan that says, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. Kind of makes sense given that they were selling vacuum cleaners, but the word suck has a very different meaning or has another meaning in American English, and it's not how you want to advertise your product. Same thing, a known uh, story, when China in the 80s was using the slogan, come alive with the Pepsi generation. Uh, so when they tried to use it in China, the translation was not a very good one, and it actually read more like Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. Again, <laughs> a very different meaning and uh, not quite a catchy fra phrase that will make you want to buy Pepsi. Those of you who speak German, here are some examples of products that didn't gain much success uh, in, in Germany. So Carol's, uh, uh, Claire Oil's, uh, Claire Oil's uh, Mist Stick um, is not a very good brand name for Germany because in German language, Mist means basically what in English um, is uh, the S word, shit, or, or manure, has kind of both meanings. And uh, so it could mean literally like manure, or it can mean, you know, what a shit. And so uh, um, I apologize for my profanities here, but, you know, that's what it means. And so you can imagine that Irish mist and mist stick are not the best brand names for Germany. Now, here are some of the examples from the 90s from uh, Ukraine uh, when I still lived there. So here are some, some things that I still remember. Uh, for example, in the early 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed and there was no um, culture of advertising, uh, the only ad advertising that we saw at that time was uh, there was this uh, Ponzi scheme company, MMM. And then one of the very first products that was advertised in Ukraine was Blue Water. And um, so they used the same brand name, Blue Water. And so there, were, there was a lot of uh, commercial where they would say Blue Water, Blue Water. And uh, in Ukrainian, it actually sounds a little like vomit. And uh, people would make jokes about it. And uh, well, I guess one thing it did achieve, it became an instantly recognizable brand name. But again, it's not the type of the brand name that you want for a... Um, um, drinking water product, right? 
Chevy Noah in Mexico, uh, you know all that one, right? So uh, Noah in Spanish means kind of doesn't go. And so it's not a very good name for a car. Though I did talk to some people and they say that actually the problems were somewhat different. And while while, while it, it actually does mean doesn't go, the, the, the reason for, for the failure of that product, of that car in the Mexican market was not due to the name. In fact, apparently they still even have gasoline uh, sold out of the brand name Nova. So I guess it could have been kind of an issue, but not a big deal. And so a similar one that I remember, is um, back in Ukraine, um, in Europe actually, or pretty much everywhere outside North America. Uh, Volkswagen, uh, they have the Golf, but then the one with the trunk, they would have different names for it. And so the very first one was called Jetta, right? And then the second one was Bora, and then I believe it was Vento, and I'm not even sure what it's called now. But uh, so while the change happened in Europe from, uh, uh, from, from uh, Jetta to Bora, Obviously, the change didn't happen in North America because Bora would be a very bad name. So what instead uh, we had in Europe was Fort Mondeo. And again, Mondeo, not, not a big deal. But in Russia, in Ukraine, I remember the word Mondeo sounds a little bit like um, a different bad word. And so uh, it's not, I don't think it really affected the sales of the car but it wasn't the type of the brand name that you want to have for your car so it's not the something that you can be proud of and uh, so there was some some language problem there and they should have done some research on the topic same thing with the coffee mocha or mocha as some people pronounce it again in some languages like the one when i where, where i grew up when you know uh, i remember when it appeared first uh, in ukraine in the 90s uh, when people were ordering it they literally would be giggling and and, and you know, uh, laughing because, you know, it's basically coffee urine, right? So again, not something that you want to use as a brand name. Now, here are a few more examples of how marketing ideas didn't work out well because of the linguistic and cultural differences. For example, Lockham is a Swedish company. And uh, so one year in 1991, around Christmas time, they wanted to add some um, holiday spirit to their brand and so they replaced the word uh, the letter o in the brand name with a heart and so it seems like a very good idea but uh, those of you who know what it means in this version would probably understand why it's a bad idea to use a slogan or, or a brand name like this one uh, this one I actually took a snapshot when i saw it it must have been like in 2005 uh, so workbench fartful again if you know English well enough you know what this means and uh, <laughs> it's not the best brand name for a, a product and probably not incidentally you don't see it much uh, sold in North America even though it was listed at some point uh, Umbro got into problems uh, sometime uh, in 2002 they released a uh, model of shoes with the name Zyklon and everything was kind of fine until somebody pointed out that the word Zyklon is the same name that was used by the uh, Nazis for the gas that they used in the gas chambers and so there was an embarrassing moment there and so a little scandal and eventually they just pulled that model off the market altogether and never uh, introduced it again. Um, the word fit in English means fit like, uh, you know, physically fit or fit as a lot of stuff fits into something. And so Honda Fit is a very popular not only model but also a very good name for that car. But in many European and Asian languages the word fit means literally it's an F word. And so in those regions uh, Honda Fit is sold under the brand name Honda Jazz. It's the same car, no difference but uh, it would have a different name because of those linguistic differences. So how would you choose the name for your product, brand, or company so that you don't run into those sort of sorts of problems? Well, I, I'll give you my advice and uh, I occasionally have to deal with these issues both because of the business, uh, Xculture for example, or other projects I run are uh, global literally we have participants from all all around the world and so we cannot afford to have a name 
that would have a bad meaning in any language or any culture. So we take those things very seriously. On top of that, um, people, you know, when they grow up and go through different stages of their maturation, uh, their cohorts would be going through, um, you know, kind of different types of challenges. And so I'm now at the stage, you know, I'm in my 30s where my friends are having babies. You know, first your friends are getting married or having boys friend, boyfriends, girlfriends, then getting married. Now we're having kids. And so I would frequently be asked by my friends um, what kind of name I would recommend for their child. And um, I've done some research on this topic because I've had two kids of my own born in Canada. But because much of my family, in fact, all of my family is not in Canada, is in Ukraine and in some other countries, it was very important for me to come up with a name that on the one hand would be recognizable all, all around the world, and at the same time would be popular enough in Ukraine where my parents, their grandparents live so that they could, you know, name, you know, pronounce the name of the child. So I had to come up with something universal enough that would work anywhere and everywhere. And it's a very important task because, you know, basically the name of the kid is the kid's brand name. And so I've been doing a lot of research on how to name people, brands, uh, uh, companies. And so here are my rules. First, um, I would exclude anything and everything that has any religious or political connotations. So, for example, here you have some pictures that would be very, very popular in some parts of the world, but you can literally be, could be killed for them in other parts of the world. So you see here the flag, very, very loved in the United States, maybe in other countries, perhaps neutral in some, but in some countries that's not a symbol that you would, you know, uh, be proudly displaying because for that you can be heard. Same thing, for example, with the, uh, uh, David Starr, again, uh, kind of very loved in some parts, potentially dangerous in others. If you recognize this man here, again, national hero, 87% apparently of his country's population love him, but um, not a very popular guy in other countries, especially not, not in Ukraine anymore. And uh, again, I would put his face on the product uh, in, for example, Russia, and that will probably drive the sales dramatically. But I would avoid using it in other countries, like in Ukraine, because probably that will lead to a, a plummeted sales. Uh, Chin His Han, the same thing, a hero in China, Mongolia. Uh, well, the dude burnt my country down a couple of times, so obviously in Europe he's not a very popular guy. Uh, Dodge Ram, again, it's a um, Chrysler's brand in the United States. And uh, in the United States, a ram is a symbol of um, energy, of strength, of um, uh, perseverance, endurance. But in many European cultures, ram is a symbol of stupidity. So it's basically you are so you know as stupid and stubborn as a ram, uh, kind of jackass American version, right? And so uh, Chrysler doesn't use that symbol in Europe. Instead, they use basically Chrysler. So they use that same star that they use for their Chrysler models. So anyway, I would avoid anything related to religion or um, uh, politics because, again, you may love your religion or your political heroes, but uh, there is a good chance somewhere else in the world they will not be loved. So I would stay away from biblical names, from uh, Muslim uh, names, from Quran, I guess. Uh, because, again, probably it wouldn't be a problem m in much of the world. But, again, if your goal is to sell your product uh, by using those religious or, or political uh, names, you probably will alien alien uh, alienate a, a substantial portion of your potential customers. I would also try to avoid, um, you know, some national symbols. Uh, unless your country is extremely neutral and people may actually be okay with that. But otherwise, again, in different parts, I mean, I cannot think of any country that wouldn't be hated by somebody else. So uh, Ukraine and Russia have problems there. Japan would be kind of okay everywhere, but China wouldn't like them. China kind of getting their own share of uh, rap. So all of those would probably be potentially dangerous if you want to have a global global product. So I would stick with words of Latin and Greek origin. First, not only do they um, have a similar meaning in many languages, uh, but also they would be easier to pronounce in many cases. And in many cases, they wouldn't really have any bad meaning because, again, many languages came from those. And so as a result, it would be a little bit more universal.
Here is an example of how main naming a company or a brand in this case uh, was done right. So Microsoft's search engine Bing when they were trying to come up with the name for this product uh, they literally had a multi-stage selection process. First they had a brainstorming session where everybody was invited to submit any names and they collected something like 20,000 initial names or 2,000 initial names. Then they had 20 linguists uh, who worked with those names and looked at them from the perspective of every possible language and they weighed out all the names that potentially could have negative meanings in any of the languages. That left them with about uh, about 50 or 60 different um, uh, versions or different uh, potential names. And at that point, they had um, focus panels, so people from different backgrounds who would literally vote on those names and who would you know comment on what they think. And so through this multi-stage iterative process uh, that involved people of different backgrounds, um, specialties, expertise areas, they eventually were able to select the name Bing that is not only um, neutral or doesn't mean anything bad in any language but also kind of sounds like bing you know something's happening fast and that's what you want for your uh, search engine here are some of the approaches that companies use to naming their products in china uh, when you do business across europe uh, european languages have some sort of similarity at least they have some similarity in terms of structure and uh uh, pronunciation well pronunciation is different obviously but you know there is some common scheme to that at least all use the same alphabet or at least almost the same alphabet when you go to China that's where you have a problem because on the one hand uh, you have to deal with the differences in pronunciation on the other hand you have to deal with the differences in writing so how would you do it would you write the name using Latin letters or would you use characters and if characters how would you do that and so there are all kinds of options here. So some would not uh, do no adaptation. So they would literally write the name um, uh, as 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 it's. I mean, like literally what it is. They would just write it in characters. So for example, Pizza Hut still remains P Pizza Hut. It just would use characters to transcribe that name. So uh, sometimes that would lead to. Um, uh, changes in the meaning sometimes it would lead to changes in pr pronunciation so for example uh, Sony uses what they call sound pr uh, sound adaptation so they use characters that sound like Sony but the translation would mean uh, something else like for example here it would mean exploring nun or priest and obviously it's not exactly the same meaning as in uh, Japanese or actually it's a Greek word Sony from the from the word sound same thing with Audi. Audi is the name of the family that um, started the company in Ingolstadt in Germany. And so they use characters that give you that same sound, Audi, but it means profound enlightening or enlighten. And so that's a different, uh, obviously, meaning than the original one, but it kind of, you know, adapts in terms of the sound as well as it also has a meaning that in some way may even relate to the brand. Some would use meaning adaptation, like for example General Motors, so they would use uh, the characters that mean General Motors, uh, but they would sound completely different, so sound is not even close. Same thing for General Electric. And some would actually try to use uh, dual adaptation, so they would try to come up with uh, characters that not only sound like the original name, but also would have um, a meaning that is similar to the original name. So for example, Nike, so they use characters that are pronounced as Nike, and they mean endurance and uh, endurance and conquer. And so Nike, that's from the Greek goddess of uh, Nike victory, I guess, right? And so in a sense, that is the same meaning and the same sound. Coca-Cola, same thing, they use a set of characters that sound Coca-Cola, and the translation is can be tasty, can be happy. And uh, it's not exactly what it means in English, but it kind of fits with this brand name. So you w might want to use that adaptation as well. Now, here is a question for you that is likely to appear on the exam. And uh, just to make sure that you've been listening to me, try to answer it. Your bonus for, being, for listening to this video lecture. All right. And the answer is... Choosing a global brand name was the purpose of the discussion. <clears throat> yeah. 
Now, another problem that you will have to deal with is counterfeits, knockoffs, right? People will try to steal your brand image and will try to make products that look like your product and try to use your uh, fame and uh, advertisement and popularity and try to sell their products under your brand name. And so here are some famous knockoffs. So you can probably guess what this was meant to be. Uh, well, Hilton Hotel, I don't think there is much competition here to the real Hilton, uh, but it's funny that they used it. Binbos, Microsoft Binbos, and you know that the real one is Microsoft Windows, not Microsoft Binbos. Spider-Man instead of Spider-Man, and Spider-Person instead of Spider-Man. KLG instead of KFC, Bloomingdale's uh, sounds the same but spelled differently. Uh, Liver's Club instead of Levi's Club and Windows 98. There was no Windows 98, there was Windows 98. So there is a difference. Uh, Stars and Bucks Cafe instead of Starbucks Cafe. So it's a different one. Uh, interestingly, this one, I had a student, uh, must have been a few years ago, who lived in the town where this place you know, town where this place is. In fact, he said he lived only about a block away from this place and he could see this uh, uh, picture at any time. And so if I remember correctly, he said it's in Palestine. And uh, the reason they don't have a real Starbucks is because of uh, the economic um, conditions there. So there is some sort of a, you know, restriction on trade and some sort of a blockade going on. And um, uh, so they couldn't, apparently, the real Starbucks cannot operate in Palestine because of the regulations they have. And so they had this kind of knockoff Starbucks. Now you have tuna instead of puma, poodle, chima, and I'm not sure why he put pim there. If you know what it means, again, not the best word that you would put in your hat. Uh, crust instead of crust, uh, s and ms instead of m and ms, tids instead of tide, uh, hike instead of Nike, uh, Sonia instead of Sony, Nescafe instead of Nescafe spelled differently, uh, Nokla instead of Nokia. This one actually reminds me of something. When I started in Germany in 93, 94, uh, at that time, and maybe still is, but at that time there was a popular uh, brand name or brand of uh, youth clothing in Europe called uh, Replay. And uh, it was actually used very similar type of uh, font as in Nokia. And uh, I had a roommate, a guy uh, that we went together with, uh, to, you know, to, uh, were in the same class in school with him. And uh, I remember, you know, we were poor students. He was local, he was German, uh, but, you know, still poor student. And uh, he spent a lot of time gathering, you know, collecting money, saving money for... Um, uh, he wanted to buy one of those hoodies, like a jacket. And uh, he wanted to buy it from Replay because it was a very popular brand. And so eventually he collected whatever ne needed, you know, the Deutsche Marks that he needed and spends all his money on this jacket. And he's so proud. It's such a great jacket, you know, replay and everything. And so in the morning we come to school and, uh, you know, everybody looks at, his, at him enviously. And then one girl says, it actually says repay, not replay. It's a knockoff. And all of a sudden, you know, he is embarrassed. And so he just takes that jacket, puts it in the bag, and uh, yeah, it's a big deal. So at the age of, we were 16 or 17 at that time, you know, you want to be popular. You don't want to be as someone who <laughs> got a wrong jacket. So while this may look like Nokia, but uh, you know, you obviously see where the problem is. Uh, added S. I love London. If I saw a t-shirt like that, I would actually buy it. Now this guy, I'm not sure how much competition he presents to the real Mercedes-Benz, but you know, so anyway, those are some of the examples and you'll have to deal with that. There is not much you can do. I mean, uh, you just have to be ready that there will be knockoffs and you have to perhaps, you know, think about how you will deal with that. Uh, you will have to perhaps um, educate your customers about how to recognize your real product. And um, yeah, it will happen, especially if you're going to countries where the institutions are not strong. So basically, as long as you're outside of North America and Europe, uh, this will be a problem. Now, for most of this lecture, we will talk about um, differences in cultural uh, environments or how cultural differences can make 
your advertisement uh, campaign more challenging, how you have to adapt to cultural differences to make your product more successful. Uh, now first, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about similarities instead. So I would like to talk about things that I, through my own experience and experimentation, <coughs> have found to be universally acceptable and <coughs> effective in all cultures. <coughs> so somehow through the course of uh, our evolution, we've developed or evolved to like some things. We find some things amusing, amazing, they, they work for us. And um, no matter what culture you are from, no matter what continent you are from, it seems like these things have exactly the same effect on you. And so I'm going to tell you what those things are and uh, give you examples of how those things have been used in marketing. I would like to stress that some of this stuff was not as rigorously tested as it, as it should have been. It's not from a textbook or from a study. I literally just observed it and I thought it would be interesting to, um, to share with you. So take it with a little you know, grain of skepticism, but it seems like it works. I've been using these examples in uh, North America, in Europe, in Asia, and in Latin America in the classes, lectures that I was invited to give. And I know that, you know, students at least were always happy and interested in seeing these things. So which tells me that, yes, it seems to work universally well on human beings. And since I have no explanation for why we have interest in these things, I call them mysteries. So somehow people supernaturally, mysteriously are attracted to these things. And so I'm going to discuss them now with you. So the first mystery that I call is, it's uh, what I call the Dominus mystery. So somehow people are always attracted to situations where a little action leads to a huge reaction. And the reason I call it the Dominus mystery is because literally, you know, we all love the situation where you push one Domino and, uh, you know, the whole chain reaction starts and people spend sometimes months creating very sophisticated, intricate, you know, schemes and then literally all for one day come in there pushing that one uh, uh, dominus and seeing how the whole, you know, scheme unravels. Uh, likewise, for example, when I was in school, must have been grade five or six maybe, there was a house not too far away from my school that was scheduled for demolition. And so we knew it would be demolished, like literally knocked down. And uh, so one thing that we wanted to do at that time or enjoyed doing at that time was uh, breaking windows in this house. And so there was all kinds of construction material and some gravel. And I remember on the um, um, recess during the you know breaks between the classes, we would run to that house, take rocks and try to break windows. And you know, the first couple of stories were broken literally in a matter of days, but then the ones, you know, on top floors, uh, those were hard to reach and you know the boys would be throwing rocks and you know waiting until somebody finally hits it and you know the glass shatters and falls down and everybody would be squealing in you know uh, enjoyment and uh, imagine if they put plywood in those windows nobody's going to run uh, uh, you know throw rocks into plywood windows I mean that's no fun right but if you have glass you know you throw a little rock and then you have this big bang big splash and that's what people like now, how you can use it in advertisement. So here is an example for it. This one is an advertisement from uh, Honda. And the beauty of this advertisement is that um, it's been used or advertised only once. Uh, I, I don't actually think this one, I believe it actually never used, was used on TV at all. It was released only online, but ever since it's been downloaded and viewed millions of times. This particular one on YouTube, literally you have millions of hits. So it's something that people, not only you don't have to pay the TV stations to show it, people would actually go to your website and watch it. And I will be watching it probably for the 25th time now, and I still enjoy it as much as I enjoyed it when I saw it the very first time. So let me show you how it looks.
Isn't it nice when things just work? Isn't that nice when things just work? Sure, it is nice and people like it. And so this particular video, as I said, has been w watched millions of times. There is no video uh, graphics in it, uh, so it's all real. They had, I believe, two Honda's Odyssey. Let me just switch it off. Two Honda's Odyssey um, used in this um, ad, and plus the third one that they didn't disassemble. And uh, it took them apparently two weeks or so to finally make it work, but it was one continuous unedited video shot of this commercial. And people love it when a little action, you know, like you push that, that one uh, gear leads to this huge reaction, the whole chain. So very interesting stuff. Now, the second mystery is what I call the mystery of the unusual. Again, people somehow are supernaturally attracted to things that are unusual. I don't know why, but people would be willing to go the extra mile, to pay the extra dollar to get something that is unusual. And here are some of the examples. For example, this house here, this one is actually a um, hotel in somewhere in my Wyoming, I believe. But then there is also a similar one like this one, not too far away from where I now live in North Carolina. So it's actually in South Carolina. Uh, it's a replace one of those kind of fun stuff museums. So this particular one is actually a hotel. And so uh, during the day, it serves as a customer, you know, I mean, as a uh, tourist attraction site, but you can actually book a room in it. And so last time I checked, everything was booked half a year in advance. So people are so interested in spending a nine, uh, night in an upside uh, down house that they would literally try to come there, you know, so badly that they would be willing to book it half a year in advance. And so inside of that house, everything does look like it's been flipped over. So you would have, you know, lighting, lighting fixtures like light bulbs on the floor and then um, beds screwed up to the top of the sea, I mean, uh, to the floor, I guess, ceiling there. So all those kinds of things. Here is another example. This man here is a painter. And in my personal uneducated opinion is that um, he's not a very talented painter. I mean, the artistic value of his paintings, I don't know, my kids can draw paint paintings like that. But the, the special thing about him is that he draws those paintings using his beard. In fact, I once saw a documentary about him, and so he did made a few paintings where he was, um, he would tie his uh, feet to the ceiling, and his beard would be kind of swinging down, and he would kind of swing back and forth, and uh, draw the picture by swinging, swinging literally, you know, hand in head down. And again, in my opinion, they just look like a little, you know, like mess on the paper. But uh, people find that attractive and interesting and would pay a lot of money for those paintings, even though, as I said, my kids would probably do better painting. Same thing like the paintings made by elephants or dolphins. Again, in my opinion, those are like, you know, kids can do better jobs. But uh, people love that process. It's unusual. And so because of that, they're willing to buy it and uh, pay more money. Now, here's an example of how it was also used in commercial uh, world. If I ever have to open a small business, you know, like a local business again, I will use the stunt to, uh, you know, get some attention. But anyway, this one goes back to 1961. At that time in New York, uh, a, a company was trying to open a, or was going to open a department store. And uh, so they advertised uh, sometime in advance that on the day of the opening, instead of uh, pouring money into you know commercials on TV and stuff like that, all they will do is they will take ten thousand one dollar bills, they will put them in a cannon, and they will literally shoot the dollars from that cannon that would be mounted on the top of the building. And so that's all they said. And uh, many people first started discussing the issue whether or not it's a good idea. Uh, people found it so unusual that they would literally, you know, have whole TV, you know, discussions about it. You know, is it a good idea? Is it legal? Is it illegal? Sure enough, on the day when the store was opened, thousands of people gathered up uh, to have a chance to catch some of those dollars, flying dollars. And then there was pretty much every news and, uh, you know, TV channel and uh, radio station there uh, broadcasting from, from that, you know, street, explaining and talking about what's going on. And so for a small 
fee of $10,000, they were able to generate so much publicity that they would never ever be able to uh, had they invested their money through the usual advertisement channels. So if I ever have to open again, I don't know, a car dealership or I don't know, a hair salon or some other type of business, I would probably do that stuff. So at least locally, everybody will know about you. Now here is also a um, store in Poland, in uh, Sopot, I believe. And uh, it's a regular department store, uh, but as you can see, it's made to look, well, unusual. And so many people, tourists, would go and shop at this store, not because it has better prices or better products, but because they like how it looks. So it actually became a tourist attraction. And so financially, it makes perfect sense to them. And uh, uh, as I said, people are willing to pay extra money and go extra mile to buy products at a store like this. And here are some more examples. Now, this one is from Russia. It's a museum, apparently. And uh, again, it's unusual, and you cannot not notice it. Here are some more. I'm not sure if you still remember what this is. Uh, that's the um, film development um, booth. And uh, so what that is, before we all had smartphones with cameras, people would have cameras with those films, you know, 36 millimeters. And when you took your pictures, you have to develop your film. And so you would have those booths where you can either drop the film and, you know, print the prints. Or I think this one particular one is actually the one where you get in and take a picture of yourself and it prints the document size picture right away. And so they made one of those plastic women that looks like she's trying to get a picture of herself get into that booth and that, so that's what it is. And this is advertisement for the Vampire Diaries 2, the film, right? So kind of they added some sort of coloring in the water and so makes it definitely much, not probably any more tastier, but at the same time fits with the, with the theme of the movie. And so they put those in movie theaters for advertisement. Now, some time ago, and uh, you may still remember this story because it's not from so, so long ago. Uh, one of the cell phone carriers uh, decided to advertise themselves on, uh, literally by printing their uh, advertisement on Euro banknotes. So what they did, they printed the map uh, of the countries in which their service has the coverage. And I don't remember which one it is. Uh, Vodafone. Oh, Vodafone, all right. They actually operate here in the United States now, too. So kind of a uh, low-cost uh, carrier or distributor. And so they literally printed their advertisement on the money, thinking that people would not throw it away. And so as a result, gives you some sort of, you know, exposure. On top of that, everybody and everyone were talking about this approach. Is it legal? Can you do it? What do you do if you get a bill with uh, this advertisement on it? Can you still reuse it? And uh, eventually, I believe they were forbidden from using it, but everybody was talking about that, and everybody received enough attention. Uh, I mean, everybody received enough exposure to the company uh, to make it known enough, uh, just pretty much everywhere in Europe, apparently, except for Germany. Now, next one, the puzzle mystery. The puzzle mystery is, um, well, it's when people derive huge pleasure and enjoyment from situations where pieces of the puzzle fit. So when pieces of the puzzle fit, we find it very interesting. And so let me give you some examples. So for example, when you put advertisement like this on the elevator, the door opens and people see the Alps, apparently where the milk comes from for this chocolate. And so the fact that you know the picture on the doors and the picture inside the elevators fit makes it very interesting and people find it interesting. Same thing like with this arm watch. If you put the picture of that arm watch on the window behind, you know, on the in the bus, people probably wouldn't even notice. But you put it in those wrist straps and people probably will take pictures with their smartphones, share it on Facebook because the pieces of the puzzle fit. So a few more here. Again, you put it simply like that, it wouldn't work. But here you kind of have that animation along with the picture. And all of a sudden, the doors and the picture fit and create one holistic uh, you know, story. And so that makes it very interesting and attractive to uh, bystanders. And a few more. This one is my favorite. Put one or the other, and nobody will notice. Put them together, and all of a sudden, people like it. People would snap pictures of it. People will find it entertaining. And here are a few more. 
oh, this one's beautiful. I mean, kind of fits together, right? So, and a few more. This one I remember from, from years ago, um, back in Ukraine, must have been in the 90s. Um, somebody was running exactly the same campaign, and so they would put kind of part of the slogan on one bus and part of the slogan on another bus. And so people, you know, hundreds of people would be, uh, sometimes hundreds, sometimes dozens of people would be waiting on the bus stop and, you know, looking at the buses. And how often do you look at the advertisement on the buses? I mean, normally you don't. I mean, who reads that stuff, right? But here, once everybody knew that there are buses with advertisement where you can only read it when there are two buses side by side with the, you know, and the, the picture matches, people literally would be kind of playing this game. They would be looking around and, you know, you would stay a stand on the bus stop waiting for the bus. And, you know, all kinds of buses and, you know, trolley buses drive by and then somebody would say, oh, there is a match. And, you know, the whole crowd would kind of look like, oh, yeah, yeah, see, it matches. Yeah, that's fun. Okay. And people would wait for another one. So all of a sudden, by not doing anything um, unusual, you created this game. And so your graphic is the same and everything is the same. But you kind of created this game. You, you made those puzzles fit together and people would spend time trying to fit them together. And a few more. Another one with Duracell. <coughs> this one was used um, before um, Eurocup 90, 1990. And again, uh, kind of not expensive. The car probably was broken in the first place. But once you place it like this, everybody will notice. Now, this one is also a very interesting one. So if you put the, the advertisement of McDonald's just simply on the billboard, it would be one thing. But here it actually makes you think that you are inside of McDonald's. And so I'm sure you'll start salivating, you know, you'll start thinking about that food. So you go to the bus stop, but it feels like you just walked into a McDonald's. This one is for a yoga studio. Just fun one. This one is entrance to karate school. And again, this kind of chopping hand makes sense in the context of, you know, where you're going. Uh, I like this one very much. So kind of makes you think about being somewhere on the beach. Mr. Clean. Well, this one is probably a little inappropriate, but you will not forget about it, right? Uh, Western Union. Uh, illustrates very well how money can be easily sent from one person to another. Oh, this one, it's, it's a Japanese toilet, and you definitely feel like you are, uh, you know, about to ski. Uh, not, not possible not to notice. I would tell you a story about a Japanese toilet, but I guess maybe some other time, but I had some good experience with Japanese toilets when I was in Japan. Anyway, that's it. If you ever go to Japan, you will see what I'm talking about. And here are a few more. Anyway, here is a question for you. And just to make sure that you've been listening to me, uh, try to answer it. And the answer is C. It's a story. The Bing, sto Bing story was a story of the challenges of choosing a good brand name for your product. <clears throat> now, the last pass piece mystery. Somehow people are supernaturally attracted to situations where they have to collect the last piece from the collection. So uh, if they have already 9 out of 10, they will pay a lot and will go extra mile and will uh, pay extra dollar for that last piece. And it seems to me that companies use it all the time. For example, when you go to McDonald's, you would frequently see those, you know, Happy Meals, and they come with all kinds of toys. And uh, once you buy one of those toys for your kids, they will start asking for all because they will say, you know, um, Alex the Lion, collect all 10. And so there are 10 different, you know, figures there in that collection. 
And it almost seems to me that sometimes they deliberately do not put one of them because, you know, you go to McDonald's again and again and again and your kid already has like three Alexes and two Glorias and one Marty, but still no Kim Julian. And it almost seems like they deliberately made that so you have to go back and back again and never collect that collection so that the kid keeps asking you for that last one piece. Uh, almost dishonest and uh, immoral, but hey, brings money, brings customers, right? The scandal mystery is a big deal. Uh, people are somehow supernaturally attracted to scandals. So if you can arrange for a scandal around your um, product, you probably will be able to sell more of it. People will notice. And so here are some of the examples uh, of scandals that I've noticed. For example, um, um, well, actually, you know what, let me go. So this is uh, one that you may not remember anymore. It was a um, scandal about the White House party crashers. So apparently a couple somehow got into the White House. There was a reception by uh, Barack Obama. And so they just made it to that reception. And they didn't do anything bad. They just took some pictures of themselves with various politicians like Joe Biden. But uh, on that same day, there were all kinds of other very important political events going on. But everybody was talking about those two people who made it to the party, even though they didn't uh, really... Uh, damage anyone. So, but anyway, the one that I like is this one. So, on August 8, 2008, there were two things happening. On the one hand, uh, Russia invaded Georgia, or there was a war between Russia and Georgia, and that's the reason I say invaded, because the, the war was happening on Georgian uh, territory. And um, as it is with Ukraine in 2015, uh, so was it with Georgia in 2008, some countries backed Georgia, some countries backed Russia. Uh, there, was, there were reports of thousands of people uh, killed, and it looked like almost like a third world war. So it was like a big, big, you know, very important thing. On that same day, the Olympic Games opened up in China, and um, in the opening ceremony, as it turned out, uh, there was some sort of a song that a little cute girl, like the one cute that you see here on the picture, was singing. And then next day, it turned out that actually she wasn't the singer. Turns out that uh, the one who was singing actually was this other girl. And so she had pretty voice, but she didn't have a pretty face. And the organizers of the Olympic Games felt that she didn't look pretty enough. So they uh, basically put a different girl, a pretty one, on the stage so that she would open her mouth while the music, the sound of the other girl was played at that same, same time. And so here you have two events happening at the same time. A wrong girl singing the song at the Olympic ceremony and this third world war and potentially, you know, reaching even your country. What would you talk about? Well, I don't know what you would talk about, but I can tell you what the planet was talking about. The planet was talking about the girls. Who cares about the Third World War? Let's talk about the scandal here. So, again, if you can arrange for a scandal around your uh, brand, around your product, uh, chances are even a, scand a scandalous information, even the negative information, will still give you a, a positive economic outcome. You know, like all those celebrities, they would leak, you know, a video of them having sex with someone and, you know, they would express their outrage and how unethical it is for someone to share that information. But then you notice that after that incident, they become much, much more popular and start making more money. So scandals, even negative scandals, tend to help. Now, here is a question for you to make sure that you've been paying attention. And the answer is D, even though cultural differences require adaptation. Uh, there are some universal attention magnets that work well in all cultures and all countries. Now, another challenge that you may encounter is advertising regulations. In different countries, you may have different rules or laws that require or regulate how you can advertise products. And so some of them, for example, relate to packaging. Some of them may be about language. Some of them may relate to culture, tradition, and things like that. So for example, here is one uh, that relates to packaging. When I went to Canada for the first time in 2003, I remember seeing packages like what you see here on the picture. And so they would have horrifying pictures of what happens when you smoke. 
And um, I was kind of puzzled as to what that is. You would see them from time to time, you know, like if there is a trash can, you would see one of those laying either inside or by the trash can. And so I thought, well, what those are? And um, uh, naturally, I assumed that those are probably some sort of products that are used to help you quit smoking, some sort of like nicorettes or some sort of like chew chewing gum with the nicotine in it. Because, you know, the, the advertisement clearly is anti-smoking, so I thought that must be some sort of a product that helps you quit smoking. And then soon enough, I figured out that those were actually cigarette packages, because turns out that unlike in the United States, where the only anti-smoking information on the cigarette packages would be that, you know, little one line on the back of the package that smoking can be harmful for your health. In Canada, the law requires that 75% of the surface area of the package, of the cigarette package, is devoted to anti-smoking information. And not you choose what you put there. The government gives you pictures that you must put there. And so as a result, if you, for example, are from North Carolina and you uh, make cigarettes, and so here you would have your, your cigarette pack would look like, you know, Marlboro and Camel and whatever else you sell. If you decided to go and sell it in Canada, you will have to completely, completely redesign your package. It would have to look completely different because that's the law in Canada. Another issue relates to labeling. So how you can label your product, particularly with ex respect to made in, made in, so where it's made. As you can imagine, people in many countries, and probably most countries, in all countries, um, feel obliged to buy products that are made locally. So when people buy stuff made in their own country, they feel that they're doing a good thing. They're being patriotic. They're helping local producers, right? So when you buy made in here, you kind of feel like you help your country, as opposed to when you buy something, let's say, made in China or whatever country uh, you are not from, then you feel like you're betraying your, your, your country because you're spending money on foreign products. And so it is advantageous uh, to the manufacturers, to the retailers, to have made in your own country on the product because people will be more likely to, ha to buy it. Turns out uh, there are special regulations in what you can name uh, or what constitutes made here or made there. For example, again, in Canada, the law says that as long as 70% of the added value of that product was generated by a company registered in Canada, you can say that it is made in Canada, right? And so these days, just about any product is actually made in many places. So, uh, you know, like this mouse, for example, it says made in China, but it probably has components from all around the world and the design could have been American. So it's not really a Chinese product per se. So in Canada, it says if 70% of this product was made in Canada, it is made in Canada, or as they say, product of Canada. And the funny thing is that sometimes you would see like pineapples, as product of Canada. And pineapples don't grow in Canada. I mean, oranges do, grapes do, but not pineapples. It's just too cold for pineapples. Turns out the reason you can put product of Canada on pineapples is because even though the actual fruits are grown in Mexico, the cost of um, uh, driving them to Canada, packaging them in those cans, uh, advertising, uh, accounting, whatever other services need to be done to create the product and put it on the shelf, so that's actually more than 70% of the product. So the, 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 the fruit itself inside the, the, the can is less than 30% of the value of the product. And because the rest of the stuff is actually covered by a company registered in Montreal, you can put product of Canada on this packaging even though the actual product comes from somewhere else. Uh, and made in matters, made in matters a lot. So for example, um, a couple of my students told me stories like this, like Americans are very nationalistic and patriotic and they feel good about buying American stuff. And so I had a student who, in fact, you know what, let me show you. You probably wouldn't see it on the picture here, but um, this is the bicycle frames that he was selling at his bike shop, not, not his where he worked. And so this is one of those very expensive bike uh, frames uh, that cost about $3,000 and made out of carbon fiber. It doesn't weigh anything very light. But anyway, now if you look at it, it says here, I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, but it says here, designed, I guess I should be showing it like this, designed in the United States, right? 
and uh, at certain angle, if you look at it, you would see that there was another label there. Like literally, you could still see the silhouette of the old label. And so he said that the original label there said "Made in China," and one of his jobs was literally to peel off those old labels and put the new labels on top. And so he would peel off the labels that says "Made in China" and then just throw it away and instead put the label designed in the United States because American customers are more gladly buying products that are made in the United States. Another student told me that she worked in one of those expensive boutiques that was selling fancy schmancy clothing. And uh, again, they would have, you know, um, price tags. And on the price tag, it would say, you know, made in China or Guatemala or made in Mexico, whatever the country was. And they literally would cut that part of the price tag where it says where the product is made. And so they would kind of imply that it's made in the United States uh, and or hide the original origin because people would be, uh, you know, uh, people would be upset, not upset, but they feel much better about buying American products. And so here is also a commercial where, you know, country of origin kind of plays a role. So this one is by BMW. And as you can probably imagine, they would not be using this sort of advertisement in the United States. I mean, in, in Germany, where BMW is registered in Munich, right? So, but this is what they use in the United States. Does it make sense that a German car company would break ground in Spartanburg, South Carolina and call it home? Does it make sense that in the height of recession, when most companies were bailing out, that they would dig in, that they would find their latest design in California and customize it in 10 million different ways? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Does it make sense that a small town in the South would make every X3, every X3 in the world? It makes perfect sense. The all new BMW X3, designed in America, built in America. Design in America, built in America. I mean, this is definitely something that Americans are happy to hear and definitely something that appeals to Americans. But as you can imagine, in Germany, they wouldn't use that sort of advertisement. Uh, also, talking about the labeling, sometimes even things like, for example, chocolate. I mean, what is chocolate? That actually may be uh, country specific. In different countries, there may be different rules that regulate what you can and cannot call chocolate. So, for example, when the European Union was integrating countries, you know, were integrating into the European Union, one of the challenges they discovered was that in different countries, um, different definitions of chocolate were used. So, for example, in um, uh, France, Germany, Sp Spain, Netherlands, um, uh, so those countries, um, you could call chocolate a product chocolate only if it contained uh, pure coca. So basically it had to be like real pure chocolate. Uh, in the UK, Denmark, Portugal, Austria, Finland, you could basically call it anything chocolate as long as it had traces of chocolate. So you could take any candy that looked brown and sweet and you could call it chocolate. And so because people feel that, um, you know, real chocolate is better than not real chocolate, whatever that is, they would pay more for the product labeled chocolate. So you'd have it the same candy bar, but if it says chocolate, people would pay an extra euro or extra dollar, right? And so because you had different rules, all of a sudden people from, or manufacturers of chocolate from UK, Denmark, Portugal, had it better because they could name cheaper candies real chocolate. And so they had a big fight and a big war and then eventually standardized the definition and uh, made it so that everybody abides by the same definition so that not some countries only could place chocolate label on products that are not really chocolate and vice versa. <coughs> Uh, another big deal is organic. Uh, again, if you are like uh, many people, like my wife, for example, you probably think that organic is good for you and not organic is not good, whatever that means, or natural for that same matter. And so in some countries, like in the United States, you can call organic whatever you want. So there are no laws that say, you know, this can be called organic and this cannot be. There are some sort of professional associations that can give you certification and, you know, like certified by American Food, I don't know, Association maybe. But technically you can call organic whatever you want to call organic. At least it was the case a few years ago. Uh, in some other countries, there may be very strict regulations, you know, in order to be 
uh, to place the word organic on your label, you have to, I don't know, grow this product without antibiotics, without pesticides and whatever else. And so again, those differences, I'm not saying that one way is better than another, but those differences may determine how you can advertise your product. And so if you move across the border, like for example, if you call your product as organic in the United States, if you move across the border, you may actually find that it would not be allowed, you would not be allowed to use the word organic in those other countries. And the market here grows dramatically in the United States. It literally grows by about 50% annually. So it's a big deal. And so uh, if all of a sudden you are not allowed to use the word organic, it actually can hurt your sales dramatically. This one is from a few years ago. I remember I was actually in Colombia at that time teaching a course. And um, uh, there was this little scandal. So uh, the pictures that you see are from the United States and they were used in, in the United States by, by L'Oreal uh, for a product called Eraser. And so presumably that product helps you uh, make the uh, lines, you know, uh, less visible in your skin, skin. And so when the product was introduced in the UK in July of 2011, they used exactly the same pictures. So they had the same billboards with the same pictures. But then uh, in the UK it was banned. And um, I'm not sure if you can guess why it was banned, but turns out that in the UK there is a law that says that that you cannot use, how should I put it, false advertisement in your advertisement. And so here they figured uh, or found out that the pictures were photoshopped. So Julia Robert, Roberts and whatever the name of the other girl, they don't look as pretty in real life as they look on this uh, picture photo so it's been photoshopped and those lines around their eyes were literally erased and so by using pictures like that you kind of falsely imply that uh, the um, eraser will erase your lines because of that eraser and not because of Photoshop and so in the United States it was fine to use this sort of advertisement but in the UK the restrictions didn't allow it to use it and so they had to come up with I guess different set of pictures also, in terms of labeling, so what you put on your cans is different in different countries. So in most of the world, you would have to put the nutrition value per 100 grams. It would say, you know, you have 100 grams and 100 grams has, I don't know, 20 grams of proteins, uh, 16 grams of uh, carbohydrates and 5 grams of fat, for example, and then the rest is water or whatever. So uh, in the United States, the system is different. In the United States, you assume that the standard is 2,000 calories per day and then you would put um, for that you know universal standard you would put how much of uh, nutrition value you have in that packaging uh, per serving so for example if the serving of your product is um, I don't know 20 grams or, or 50 grams or you know whatever the serving is usually if like it's a can usually the whole can is the serving or you know if people eat only half of it that would be the half of the serving and so the label would say in one serving uh, what percent of the daily recommended value of proteins and uh, you know uh, carbohydrates is in that one serving so for example when you look at I don't know potato chips they would say one serving is five potatoes uh, I mean five of those chips uh, to a total of let's say I don't know one ounce and that contains 10 percent of your daily intake of fat and five percent of your daily intake of carbohydrates and so on and obviously nobody eats only five of those if you buy a whole bag you eat a whole bag but by manipulating the serving size people or the companies can kind of create an impression that there is less junk in that food or vice versa now, even when you talk about product of, uh, it's not even about that you actually put that it's product of. Sometimes you may be prosecuted for um, um, falsely implying connection without actually saying that it's from there. For example, you see here a picture uh, of a, a chocolate bar uh, that was designed to look as if it's Swiss chocolate. And again, Switzerland has a reputation for quality uh, from arm watches to you know knives to food. And um, if you can say that your product is Swiss, people probably will pay extra 10, 20, 30%. And so there was a British um, uh, candy maker, uh, Cadbury Sweepers. And so one of their chocolate bars was named Swiss chocolate, even though it was not from Switzerland. And they had pictures of, you know, these cute kids um, 
with the Alps, Swiss Alps in the background and the kids wearing national Swiss suits. And so by doing so, they kind of were creating an impression that it's a uh, Swiss chocolate bar. And so the Swiss were not happy with that and obviously complained. And eventually the British maker had to change their uh, packaging because it was false advertisement. Uh, it was an implication that it's a Swiss product, whereas in reality it is not. Same thing again, sometimes country of origin can be a good thing or sometimes it could be a bad thing. So if you're buying, for example, vodka or black caviar made in Russia is probably a good thing. But if you're buying cars, uh, not sure if, you know, made in Russia is a good thing. By the way, Smirnov, that's a bad example. It's actually uh, Finnish, right, from Finland. So uh, I, I obviously implied to be from Russia, but it's actually not a Russian product. Uh, sometimes when you advertise your product or go international, you have to adjust your advertisement because the brand image that your product has in your country may not be applicable in other countries. Uh, for example, Hagen does it's a very expensive ice cream producer. Uh, they have a very successful line of ice cream um, called Green Tea, so Green Tea Ice Cream that is very popular in Asia and for a good reason because Asia is a kind of tea loving uh, culture and uh, so green tea ice, uh, ice cream is, is a popular product there but um, it was not very popular in Europe and North America no matter how much they tried and so in North America it's all about vanilla chocolate and uh, strawberries right and so green tea they tried it never caught on it never worked out so they had to um, change the lineup of products and so in Asia they still sell the green, green tea but in North America they no longer do. Altoids is another popular product and if you are from North America you probably have seen them many times and so in North America they are sold as breath uh, fresheners. So it's basically like your Tic Tacs, right? And the reason for that is because uh, in reality that product is a medical product. So uh, it's been around for about 200, th uh, 200 years and it was envisioned as a medicinal product that is used to uh, for sore throat. So that's a product that people would eat when they have problems with their throat. But when they started selling it in the United States, um, sometimes in the 50s or, or 40s of the last century, they noticed that more and more people were buying this product uh, to freshen their breath, like teenagers would buy it before going on a date and things like that. And since there are no known side effects, instead of selling it at pharmacies as it is in the rest of the world, in the United States, Altoids are sold um, in just regular drug stores, in regular, uh, m meaning grocery stores. So uh, they're just basically your regular candies. And um, yeah, sure, I mean, it's, as long as it makes sense, as long as it makes financial sense, uh, we can change the advertisement and the image of the product altogether. And uh, here is an example of Muji. Muji is a company that sells all kinds of stuff. Uh, again, uh, it's a similar one to European Target and uh, I mean uh, American Target and European IKEA. It's like IKEA in the sense that it makes its own products and it's like Target in the sense what it sells. So it sells all kinds of, you know, like office supplies and some clothing and, you know, all kinds of things, house supplies. And uh, the reason it's so curious is because in Japan it's a popular brand <coughs> but it doesn't have any you know, cool status to it. So it's perceived as a solid good product that is uh, sold at an inexpensive price. In North America or in Europe, when they uh, started selling it there, and actually Europe, it, it's not sold in North America, in Europe, people, when they saw the Japanese product, they had this perception of Japanese quality, you know, like samurai type of stuff. And so people were very, very excited about this product. And so as a result, Muji decided to sell it in Europe uh, at a much higher price. So in Muji it's sold as a luxury product, whereas in Japan it's sold as just your regular grocery store, Aldi, right? Um, now here is a question to make sure that you've been paying attention to me. And the answer is A. Uh, product of Canada, chocolate, organic. These are examples of challenges of international marketing and branding, in particular with regards to the evolving laws of labeling and identification. 
Now, here are a few more examples of how culture can play a role in your advertisement. For example, uh, the United States is a very individualistic culture. And um, uh, Asia, for example, tends to be much more collectivistic. And so here are some examples of how these sorts of things may have a very important implication for product branding. For example, iMac, iPhone, iPad, all of those have that I in the name. And in English-speaking countries, people really like that part because, you know, uh, iPhones, Apple products in general, have this image or perception of being very individual, expressing your individuality, difference. In fact, when you see product placement of Apple in American movies, like, for example, if you've seen Legally Blonde, there is this scene, and it happens all the time, where, you know, the camera kind of captures the classroom and goes around, and you see all those Harvard students in gray suits with gray computers. And uh, then all of a sudden, you see this girl who is not wear wearing a gray, su uh, gray suit. She's wearing a pink suit. And her computer is a shiny white Mac. And so that individuality, that difference, rebellion in a sense, that's all packed in that aisle ladder. And in reality, by the way, it has nothing to do with information or individuality. It actually has to do with the word interim. And, uh, you know, just read about that. It's about Steve Jobs coming back from the next, back to Apple, and getting the CEO job, but only as a uh, interim CEO. And so he was signing his name as iCEO. And then uh, that's where they came up. They were working on the Mac product, but they added iMac, and that's how it's talking, basically, you know, ever since they use I, I for all Apple products. Uh, now, in Asia, it's a whole different story. So in Asia... Uh, when Sony first uh, started making Walkman, so those, uh, you know, players that you would listen to, things that we used to listen to before CD players and before smartphones, the first years they would actually have two sets of ear sets attached to the player because in Asian collect collectivistic culture at that time, it must have been 70s or 80s, it was perceived as unethical, uh, insensitive, to put, you know, cover your ears and listen to the music only by yourself. So the mobile personal devices were made in a way that you could share your experience with others. So you would have multiple sets of ear pieces connected to the, uh, to the uh, system so that you could also share your music with your neighbor. And here are a few examples of how products are advertised in collectivist versus individualist cultures. So America is an individualist country or culture and in America if you want to sell a product you have to appeal to individuality to your difference to your uniqueness and this is what McDonald's does when they advertise Happy Meal in the United States Funky 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 Everybody clap your hands hand. clap 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 your hands clap 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 your hands right foot left stump Cha cha, real smooth. Turn it out. One hop this time. Right foot, two stumps. Left foot, two stumps. Slide to the right. Slide to the left. Crisscross. Get funky with it. Oh, yeah. Come on. Cha cha now, y'all. Everybody clap your hands. Come on, y'all. How low can you go? Can you go down low? All the way to the floor? I'm out of here, y'all. Peace, peace. So if you are from the United States or from Europe or perhaps even from Latin America, you probably found this commercial effective. Uh, you probably found it funny and entertaining. And so you probably even giggled and found it, you know, uh, fun to watch. I was trying to show it once in Japan. I was given a lecture and there were, I don't know, 120 people maybe in the audience. And uh, I showed it exactly like I showed it to you. And there was silence, like everybody was sitting just like this. And I'm like, so what's wrong? And they say, well, it's so impolite. I mean, he shows up to dinner late, and then he's uh, 
completely looking like a, like a parrot, looks very different from everyone else, uh, completely disrespects the family, so he just does whatever he wants to do, you know, listens to the music, and then he just adios you all, you know, without even talking to them. So that's very inappropriate. So from the collectivist high power distance point of view, that's not even, you know, it's, it's not funny, it's actually offensive. Now, Asian cultures are much more collectivist, and if you want to sell your products in Asia, you have to appeal to the collective, to the uh, bonding, to the social aspect. And this is how McDonald's advertises its products in Asia, and this particular one is, I believe, from Philippines. Parang ang tagal na namin magkakilala. Kung tayo ay bata pa Yung mga gusto ko, gusto rin yan. Tapos biglang... Kahit hindi rin naging kami sa uli, siya pa rin ang first love ko. So as you can see, it's all about bonding. It's all about, you know, this love. Um, and, um, um, you know, something like this wouldn't really work very well in an individualistic culture. But in the Asian culture, in the collectivist culture, it works very well. And yes, they do eat uh, French fries with ice cream and chocolate. And uh, I'm not sure what exactly it says there in the commercial. I believe one student once translated and told me that the final phrase is, well, some things change, like, you know, now she's with a different guy, but some things don't change. You still love the same McDonald's, right? So anyway, those are some of the examples. Let me give you a few more. So um, these are the ones that we just showed. Here are a few other bloopers that didn't take into account the cultural differences. So AT&T, it's a uh, telephone service provider in the United States, uh, sometime in the 80s decided to expand into Latin America. And so what they did was they just used the same commercial that they used in the United States and they uh, used it in uh, Argentina. And it didn't work very well, uh, and this is what the commercial looked like, and I'm curious if you can guess what was wrong with it. So the commercial shows a family, <clears throat> a man and a wife, uh, a husband and a wife, getting ready to go and visit their friends. And um, uh, so they're getting ready and apparently running a little late. And so the wife said, well, honey, could you please call uh, the friends and tell them that we're going to be a little bit late. <clears throat> and so the message of that commercial was that if you have AT&T phone, if you are running late, you can call your friends and let them don't know that you would be late. And uh, so you can communicate. So very convenient. And it didn't work very well in Latino uh, cultures. And the reason for that is twofold. One, in those cultures, uh, men are ascribed a very different status than women. So men are perceived as, you know, macho, masculine, you know, uh, the head of the family. <clears throat> and so in their culture, uh, women don't tell men what needs to be done. You know, they don't tell, go and call friends. Uh, it would be as absurd as in, for example, some European cultures or North American cultures, my four-year-old son tells me what to do to his father. So that kind of stuff. Second, in Latin American cultures being late to a gathering is not a problem at all so nobody's going to call you just because they're going to be a few minutes late being up to an hour late is perfectly acceptable and expected so that part is definitely uh, you know not an important issue as far as you know informing friends that you might be late another example uh, is um, um, one from the United States when Procter & Gamble was trying to um, advertise skin lotion with the same commercial they used in uh, Europe. And so the, the story of that commercial is the following. Uh, so a woman takes bath, takes shower, and so she exits the shower cabin, right? And so she's uh, standing in front of a mirror and applying her um, uh, skin lotion. And this 
at this time her husband is walking by and sees through the open bathroom doors uh, sees her naked wife you know applying the skin lotion and presumably her skin is so radiant and, and gleaming that he really likes it and he cannot resist the temptation and he approaches her and kisses her on the shoulder and so the message is that this lotion will make you look so beautiful that your husband will love you even more and it didn't work very well in Japan and uh, the reason for that is because in their culture uh, husbands and wives have how should I put it it's not that they're not intimate enough as they are in North America or Europe but there are certain things that they do not intrude on each other so like for example if the wife is taking the bath the door wouldn't be open and the husband wouldn't you know be looking at it and so it's kind of inappropriate a little in their culture as one of the students told me uh, she was from Japan she said it's as if uh, you have the same exactly same storyline in the United States but instead of husband and wife you have father and like a 15 year old daughter so a 15 year old daughter or 16 year old daughter is naked in the bathroom and the father sees oh you honey you're so pretty slaps her on the butt and kisses her on the shoulder so that would be inappropriate right so that kind of stuff um, now also there are some traditions in different cultures and uh, so here are some examples of where not paying attention to those traditions got companies in trouble for example this symbol gesture is uh, perceived or means kind of okay everything is good in America as you know but it usually has a negative meaning in most other cultures so it's basically your equivalent of you know flipping the finger and uh, so you have to be very careful about that because you know in many parts of Latin America for example this would be a bad gesture and so American companies used to place this symbol on some let's say catalogs for example of products and so it's it's not a good idea to do so then Nike for example um, had uh, some problems selling their um, golf balls that they would normally sell in sets of four in the United States and so they used exactly the same product in exactly the same packaging and tried to sell those products in uh, Japan and I think it was the same story in China and nobody would buy buy them like literally nobody would buy your golf balls and they were like that's strange I mean they seem to like Nike so why not buy those packages turns out that in Asian cultures at least in Japan and uh, China uh, four number the number four is considered to be an unlucky number it's like 13 in European and American cultures but much worse and uh, so just like in the United States you often see uh, skyscrapers that don't have the 13th floor it literally goes 12 14 same thing in Japan you wouldn't see the fourth floor it goes three and then five and so not being sensitive to those you know superstitious beliefs about the numbers uh, could get you in trouble and vice versa in China for example number eight the number eight is uh, considered um, lucky and so if you can sell something in the sets of eight or can have price with eights in it people will like it just like in the United States all the prices are 9.99 right in uh, China it is 8.88 and if you go to Chinatown in North America you would also notice that many stores I mean in many of those stores there uh, many prices would be 8.88 so they consider that number lucky interestingly I once read a story about the uh, 8888 times number telephone number in Beijing so in Beijing it's so big that they have to use eight digits not seven digits as it's usually done in Europe and North America and um, uh, obviously you know the number with eight eighths would be considered as a very lucky one and at some point it, it was actually not in service and I'm not sure if that's still the case I would imagine that by now probably it's in service again but there was a per period when it was not in service because apparently the person who had it or several people who had it before all died tragically there was someone who died in a airplane crash and somebody in a car crash something like that and so at some point they decided not to give that number to anyone because it actually turned out to be unlucky now here we talked about culture now let's talk a little bit about um, other things related to distribution of products and so first let's talk about distribution channels you have uh, two basic approaches you have uh, inclusive channels and you have intensive channel I mean exclusive channels and intensive channels uh, by definition you can probably guess what those are so exclusive channels 
that's when your products are sold exclusively through a particular retail chain. So you cannot buy them anywhere else but only through a particular distributor. Uh, I once worked for a company that was selling agricultural machinery and um, uh, it was in Ukraine and um, one of the important products of Ukraine is potatoes. And um, on the market, there are all kinds of different potato diggers, so machines that dig up potatoes, you know, from the soil. But at least at that time, there was only one self-propelled potato digger, and it was a German com uh, German company that made them, and they were called Holmer. Holmer is uh, the name of the guy who created the company. At that time, he was something like 80 years old, or definitely beyond his in, into his 70s and possibly 80s. And so my company wanted to have the uh, wanted to have the ex exclusive distribution rights for those products, so we wanted to be the only company in Ukraine that sells Holmer potato diggers, and um, we you know would meet with Mr. Holmer, uh, Holma as they pro pronounce in German Holmer. Uh, multiple times and tried to convince him to give us the exclusive distribution rights and eventually he did and um, it did work kind of okay for a while but then he uh, revoked the exclusive distribution rights and gave them to other companies in Ukraine and so when you have the exclusive distribution rights you have a number of advantages and disadvantages on the one hand uh, the beauty is that you have less competition because if anyone wants to buy that product they have to come to you it also creates incentives for you to invest in advertisement because if there are multiple retailers of that same product, you don't want to advertise because why should you? Uh, you'll wait until someone else does it. And uh, so it's almost like a free rider incentive. So uh, when you give someone exclusive distribution rights, normally you as a manufacturer can relax about advertisement because they will be interested in advertising. So uh, they'll probably have to invest their own money. Whereas if you use an intensive channel, everybody who wants to advertise the product, that, uh, I mean to, to, to retail the product, retails the product, you would probably have to um, uh, do the advertisement yourself. <clears throat> but then obviously the risk is that if you give uh, distribution rights to only one company, then uh, you potentially limit the market. And if you had more retailers, you probably would be able to reach more customers and sell more and make more, <clears throat> more, more profits. Now, um, sometimes what some manufacturers and some distributors do is uh, manufacturers in many cases would give you the distribution rights but they would demand that you sell only their own products and you would not be allowed to sell products from competition. So for example, if you are a car dealership and let's say if you sell uh, Volkswagen cars, you normally would not be allowed to sell Mercedes or, or, or other cars, right? Or, or maybe, I don't know, Toyota. Uh, if you have a trade-in, if you have a used car, yes, you can sell it obviously but um, you would not be allowed to sell brand new cars from other distributors uh, and that makes sense you don't want competition going on within your own distribution center at the same time what many distributors do is they would open a different company and it could be the same family that owns both companies but uh, on paper it looks like those are two competitors so for example here you have pictures um, of the distribution centers for agricultural machinery from Canada. Uh, one sells John Deere, the other one sells Massey Ferguson, big, you know, rivals. Uh, but both of these companies are owned by the same family. In fact, the, the owner's name is the same, Dave Cook, with the only difference that one of them is owned by the father and the other one is owned by the son. And they're literally across the street, you know, like literally, you know, you can see one and the other right there. And so by creating two separate legal entities, two se separate legal companies, uh, the Cook family was able to uh, kind of on paper separate the competition. And so one signed the contract with the green machines, the other one with the red machines. And so everyone seems to be happy even though they're selling products from both um, brands. Uh, you see the same thing here in Greensboro, for example. Um, so there is a Van York family. And so my Honda Odyssey is from Van York dealership. But when I go to service uh, my car at the dealership where it was bought, you would see that on that same intersection, you would have Van York Chevy, you would have Van York uh, Toyota, and Van York Honda, I believe. 
and so it's the same brand the same family that owns them even though on paper it looks like different companies another problem when you go with them um, um, intensive channel so when you as a manufacturer sell your products through everyone who's willing to sell all of a sudden you will be one of many uh, so when you have your own store or when you have stores that work only with you you have a lot of leverage your product gets a lot of attention you can tell the store how your product should be displayed how your product should be advertised and promoted right but if you decide to sell your product through companies like um, you know target or walmart who sell everyone's products that they feel is interesting then all of a sudden you're one of many brands hundreds if not thousands of brands that could be found on, in that store all of a sudden your product can be placed in a location that is not very convenient for the consumers to reach for example at many stores if you want your product to be displayed on the shelves that are at the eye level uh, you have to pay extra because otherwise they will put it lower and people will not bend to see where your product is people are lazy and so by simply putting it in the right spot you all of a sudden can see an increase in sales by 20 30 40 percent of your product but again if you go with exclusive uh, intensive channel then all of a sudden you don't have um, any leverage and you have to literally pay to be uh, um, treated in a way that you want to be treated treated so here is a question to see if you know the answers And it's called intensive channel C. Another interesting rele relevant um, definition is what we call value density. Value density kind of tells you how much value a unit of weight uh, costs of your product. So let me give you examples to understand what I'm talking about. For example, cement has low value density because a lot of cement costs little money. You can have many pounds, many kilograms of cement and the price will still be very cheap, like a dollar or two. Perfumes, on the other hand, have high value density. So a small tiny bottle of perfume can cost $50, $100. So one unit, you know, little gram of it costs a lot. And so that in many cases determines your distribution channels. For example, you would normally not see cement imported from different countries, right? You know, so for example, if you are in the United States, chances are the cement that you buy here is from the United States. It may be cheaper to make it in China, but the transportation cost will not be worth it because value density is low and you'll have to pay so much for moving those pounds that the price that you get for those pounds will not pay off. Uh, perfumes on the other hand are easy to move or like laptops or iPhones that little thing costs so much money that you know transportation doesn't constitute much in the in the total cost structure of that product so uh, as a result value high value density products can be distributed more wider in terms of geographic areas because uh, distribution channels I mean distribution uh, cost may not be so expensive uh, low value density products as I said like paper or perhaps furniture those usually have to be made local and sold local because you know just transportation is too high per pound uh, sometimes you also have to think about your local skills uh, here is an example from the 2000s when Acer it's a Taiwanese uh, electronics manufacturer uh, like they make laptops and things like that so they decided to start selling their products in Russia and normally they would have their own stores or they would work with stores but they would deliver the product to the store and then whoever sells it sells it they tried to do that in Russia and it didn't work for them uh, the product is high value density so in a few pounds you have a lot of money and so if you have a whole truckload of laptops it's it's millions and millions of dollars right so it's a very attractive target for um, you know bandits for for you know kidnapping and demands for ransom or just you know stealing it and selling it and so uh, Acer was trying to move those products across Russia and many of the trucks were uh, literally stolen and sometimes even drivers killed 
And so they tried many ways and it didn't work. And so eventually they felt, you know what, we don't have enough experience. So we're not going to do it, um, the transportation, the delivery in Russia. We're still interested in selling the product in Russia. But what are we going to do? We're going to deliver it to Finland. And then from Finland, we're going to hire someone uh, who knows something about distribution in Russia. And those guys will do the delivery and they will have a better time dealing with uh, their, their local uh, you know, partners. Finally, a very interesting topic, uh, different dual pricing, basically. Uh, sometimes you want to charge different prices in different locations, right? So sometimes you may have a product like, for example, let's say software, Windows software, Windows 98 or Windows uh, XP or Vista or whatever, 7th, right? 8th now, I guess. And so uh, you want to sell it for four or $500 in the United States, but you know that you will not be able to charge that much in, for example, uh, China or in Ukraine. And uh, so there you are happy to sell it, let's say, for $10. Because for you to make a copy of that DVD with the software that constitutes Windows, uh, it's probably, I don't know, five cents if you make a lot of those copies. So even if you sell it at $10 in Ukraine, it's still a huge profit. And if you don't sell it at $10, nobody's going to buy them. But the challenge then becomes, what do you do? How do you make sure that people will not go to Ukraine, buy a whole truckload of those DVDs in Ukraine for $10, and then come back to the United States and sell them here for 25 thereby undermining your ability to sell those products for $450? How can you make sure that you can sell your same product at different prices in different locations and prevent re-export, prevent potential people, I mean potential retailers who will buy it where it's cheap and resell it where it's expensive at a price that will undermine your own higher price in that location. Plus, additionally, sometimes prices have to be different because you know there will be different um, uh, transportation cost. I mean, if you make product here and sell it here and there, and there it should be expensive because it costs money to move it there. Uh, there may be different taxes, different tariffs. Uh, there could be all kinds of things. Plus, as I said, some people just may be willing to pay more. And so what can you do to make sure that there is no re-export? Well, there are a number of things. So for example, uh, for some products, there are literally different standards. So they're locked to work only in some markets. Uh, if you still remember DVDs, they were actually locked to work in particular markets. You had like a map of the world and there were a total of five zones or six zones. And if you buy your product in zone one, like for example in North America, it literally wouldn't play on DVDs in zone two or zone three and vice versa. And so the problem was that, yes, in China, in Zone 6, they would sell it much cheaper than in Zone 1. And they don't want you to go to Zone 6, buy a lot of those DVDs and bring them back to the United States and sell them at a lower price. And prevent, prevent you from doing that, they would actually, to prevent you from doing that, they would actually lock it so it wouldn't work in their own region. Uh, regional warranty. For example, uh, uh, er electronics are much cheaper in uh, America than they are in Europe. And I don't know why, but like a computer would cost you usually a couple hundred dollars less in North America than in Europe. So every time when I go to visit my friends in Europe, they would ask me to buy some, some computers or, or it used to be digital cameras too, uh, and you know, bring them as a gift or you know, they would pay me the money back. And uh, I don't mind and I always do that, but uh, the problem with that is that manufacturers they know that they can charge more in Europe than they can in North America. Just historically, there is a difference. And uh, they don't want you to go to North America, buy a lot of those things, and then resell them in Europe. So what they do, they limit warranty. They say, yes, sure, you can buy and you can bring it here. But if it breaks, the warranty will not be valid. You will have to send it back to a North American service center for service. And so that definitely creates so much hassle that many people think, you know what, I'm going to pay extra $20 for the digital camera or extra $200 for a computer and buy it in Europe. There may be also all kinds of restrictions in terms of services, like for example, if you call a service line and ask for help with your, let's say, electronics, they may not be able to offer that. There may be also locks, like for example, if you buy a cell phone in North America, it would be locked for a particular carrier, and so you cannot just simply move it 
uh, to a different country and use it there. And obviously you can hack, you can, you know, unlock it somehow, but it would be illegal and it would be difficult. There may be also restrictions on the number of units that you can buy. For example, when iPhone 5 uh, was released in China, it was much cheaper in China than it was in the United States, even though it was exactly the same product. And so to make sure that Americans would not buy you know, a whole container of those phones in China and resell them at lower price in North America, uh, they would uh, limit a number of sales to five per person. So you couldn't buy more than five um, uh, per person and so as a result kind of that makes it not very interesting to buy them in small quantities and ship them to the United States. Anyway here is a question for you to make sure that you know what we were talking about and the answer is D value density. <laughs> Finally we we'll want to talk about transfer prices and it's not quite marketing, uh, but you know, normally it's put in this topic because it's all about pricing. And here, um, it's it's more about accounting, really. So transfer pricing, that is when you have subsidiaries or uh, when you have partner companies across the world and you would shift um, kind of money within accounts within those companies to minimize your taxes. And I'll explain to you how it works because uh, the companies that I worked for did it and many companies do it. Like for example, if you ever wonder why Google has a subsidiary in, uh, not subsidiary, one big office in Ireland, that's because of the transfer pricing. So the way it works is this. A company would be operating in a country with a high corporate tax, for example, the United States or Ukraine for that matter. The company would then open a uh, subsidi subsidiary Subsidi subsidiary in a country where the taxes are low, like for example Ireland. So for example corporate income tax in the United States is 35% and in Ireland it's something like 11%, so one third of it. And uh, so they would make all the money obviously in the United States because it's a large market but not so much in Ireland. But then they would on paper um, for example, hire an employee from the Irish company to provide some sort of consulting services to the uh, American operations. And so the guy shows up at the American office in Polo Alto and, uh, you know, says 10 words and they say, oh, this is brilliant. Let us pay you $10 billion for your service. And they would have a contract. And so for this one hour where he was, you know, consulting them, we're going to pay him $10 billion. And so they pay $10 billion from the, the American subsidiary to the Irish subsidiary. And so what it does, all of a sudden, the American subsidiary is profitless. I mean, yes, we worked the whole year, we made $10 billion in profits. But you know what, we pay $10 billion for the services to our Irish partner. And all of a sudden we have no profit, so there is no tax that we would pay. And then the Irish company says, well, we didn't really make much money. We, in fact, didn't make any money. All we had was a little office here. But, you know, this one contract we had, we made $10 billion. So we're going to pay taxes on $10 billion here, which is 10% or 11%. Thank you very much. And by transferring that money from one subsidiary from the high income tax country to the low income tax country, all of a sudden you can save the difference in taxes. And so it's perfectly legal and there are all kinds of legal, you know, loopholes that allow you to do that. And so that's why they have accountants. And so by doing this, you can sometimes even pay no taxes anywhere. And sometimes you may even be entitled to a refund, tax refund from the state if you do it in a smart way. Sometimes the pricing may not even be up to you. I mean, in free societies like the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, usually you as a seller can determine how much you want to charge for your product, right? So whatever you want to charge, that's what you charge, and you try not to charge too much because not much of your product will be sold, but you try to charge not too little because in that case it will not be profitable. But sometimes it could be the case that um, the government will tell you how much you can charge for your product. And so I'll give you two examples. One goes back to the 90s, uh, 2000s to Ukraine. So at that time we had Yulia Timoshenko as the um, um, uh, prime minister. 
and uh, she was kind of dictatorial in her inclinations, you know, as to how to manage the economy. And uh, at that time, we had a number of crises. There was like sugar crisis, there was uh, meat crisis, and there was uh, gasoline crisis. And by that, I mean, you know, prices started going up, and then the product, you know, would be in short supply. And so uh, she tried to present herself as the people's woman, you know, the, as the people's politician. Uh, she couldn't think of anything better than to impose an, a limit on how much you can charge for your product. So they literally would said, say that the gas cannot be more than a dollar a liter, for example. And so if you wanted to operate in that country, you may want to charge more and you know people would pay more. But the law says that that's the maximum price. And so as a result, you would be uh, constrained by how much you can charge for your product. And so as a result, that can completely change how you, you know, promote your product and how much of it you sell it. Same thing happened a couple of years ago in Venezuela. So Hugo Chavez, before he died, uh, he was trying to, again, deal with the economic problems and, you know, inflation, growing prices by imposing import, I mean, by imposing um, um, upper limits on how much can be charged. And so the, the re literally they would say, you know, from now on, rice cannot be more than 20 cents per kilogram. And, you know, corn cannot be more than whatever cents per kilogram. And so that presents a serious challenge because, you know, it may be not profitable for you to sell at that price, but you cannot do anything. And so you have to completely change your marketing approach, distribution approach. Finally, anti-dumping regulations. Um, so dumping, you know what that is, right? So sometimes companies would dump prices, so they would reduce prices so much that their competition cannot uh, survive. And usually it's a large company that reduces prices for a short period of time because they have some sort of, you know, um, um, kind of cushion. They have some extra savings, and so they can survive on sub-low prices for like half a year but their competition may not be able to survive. And so they dump prices for a long time, I mean, for a short time. The competition, smaller companies don't have the resources to survive, so they have to basically sell out. And then the big company would either buy them or just let them fail. And then uh, when that is over, they would rise prices because they're the only ones who are left. And so they're monopoly and they can charge whatever they want. And so sometimes there would be anti-dumping regulations. So literally sometimes the government can say, no, you cannot sell for less than something. So here it's the lower limit, not the upper limit. And so those are kind of rare cases, but they happen from time to time. In the United States, for example, there were a number of cases when, um, let's say a few years ago, American tire manufacturers, so people who make rubber tires for cars, were able to argue that, uh, successfully argue, argue that China um, is engaged in uh, price dumping on tires. So they said that the tires sold here are actually sold at a loss to the Chinese manufacturers because the price here is actually even lower than it is in China, or it is, at least it should be higher if you, uh, you know, take the domestic market price plus the transportation, so it shouldn't be any lower. And so uh, eventually the import tariff of 20% was imposed on Chinese tires to punish them for allegedly keeping prices artificially low. Whether or not it was a good idea or a bad idea, we already talked. Uh, it actually created many more economic losses than savings. I mean, it was good for American tire makers, no question about that. But it was bad for American consumers and apparently bad for American producers, I mean, for Chinese producers, because they wanted to charge less and they were forced to effectively raise the prices. But in any case, the point here is that sometimes you can't even charge as little as you want. So you cannot just hand out your products for free. There may be some protectionist measures, and so there may be anti dumping regulations that may pre preclude you from charging less than you want. And here is a question here, and the answer is A, dual pricing. And here's another one, and it's called market dumping or price dumping occurs. And this is what you need to know on the exam. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next lecture.